how is everybody doing? It's Strength Chat episode 140, and today I have got a very special guest for you. Today I'm joined by a sports scientist, a personal trainer, a sports massage therapist, and nutritionist. He's worked with Hollywood A listers, world champions, and European royalty. Today I am joined by the one and only Luke Worthington. How are you doing? I'm all right, thanks. And you? I'm not, I'm, I was going to say, I'm, I'm not very well then. I mean, I'm not bad. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot for, um, for taking the time to jump on, Luke. Yeah, um, no how, has, how has everything been with you? What's been, what's been happening in your world? Um, well, it's been a changing world, as I think it has for everyone in our, in our industry, um, which has been interesting. <laughs> um, some yeah. of it has been, it's, yeah, some, from, some of it's been quite a real you know, test and challenge for sure. Um, and another, other parts of it have been, I guess, eye-opening really in terms of, um, you know, me putting some slightly different strands into my business that I hadn't perhaps thought about doing. Um, and some stuff that I thought, well, I'll just have a little go at that has actually been very successful. And other stuff that I thought, well, that's a bit of a banker. <laughs> it doesn't work so well. <laughs> um, so, yeah, which I guess is probably... It's probably the same for a lot of people in our world, really. It's an, you know, it's an industry that's built on personal relationships and being in the same space as people. So take that away and we've got to start thinking on our feet. Yeah. Have you started me doing, um, so obviously we had a little bit of a chat before we started recording, but are you finding that you're doing a lot more sort of the online type of sessions rather than in person? Or yeah, well, I'm actually, so right now I've actually got a few people doing like a bit of a blend. Um, yeah. So I don't have any anymore who are who are solely online as soon as we're available to when we've been back at back in business if you like or back <laughs> in real business for well just over a month now as soon as it was available i was i was trying to encourage people to get back into that um so, you know in-person coaching where i feel yeah uh, i i feel i'm delivering a better product that, that way um you know i think that people are getting a lot more out of me if we're in the same space and i can actually do what I intend to do with them um, as opposed to trying to you know do that with either with with limited resources for a start um, you know it's very though I do have a few clients who set themselves up some some pretty impressive personal gyms for the most part you go in with limited equipment limited resources um, and of course no in-person demonstration correction queuing all of that stuff um, so I, as soon as possible, I was trying to encourage people to get back in. Um, I think that's where you get the best out of me. I think that's where, where I'm going to be able to really affect change in people, which is what I want to do. Um, and so far, it's, it's kind of gone reasonably well. <laughs> I, I would say I'm probably... Um, I've probably got two, two people who are still on this kind of blended, like some online, some in person. Hopefully by the, you know sort of the next couple of weeks we'll shift all that over to to back to full strength. Yeah, I'm glad I'm sort of in agreement with you there because I know we did uh, the gym that I work out and the work out and the clients that I work with. Um, we started off doing quite a lot of stuff online just because obviously you know gyms were closed and everything. But I see what you mean that there's only so much you can do through. It's a little bit different when I've had um, conversations like what me and you are having now, uh, and you can you can just have a chat, but. Um, when you're trying to correct form, I always feel as though there could be a, um, a system where I can put my hand through the laptop and actually, um, yeah, try and correct them there because exactly as you are kind of feed off being in in person and being able to coach coach people in person, which um, you know is a, I think is a big part of a, of a role as a coach and a personal trainer. Yeah, or it, or it should be certainly. Um, I think you know there's always been this sort of like. You know the two camps of the fitness industry, if you like, the kind of like the group exercise people and the one-to-one -one personal trainers. Um, this this sort of I, I guess online remote Zoom type setup perhaps suited the group exercise people a little bit more in terms of the the role is a little bit more. I'm going to present and and I'm I'm going to deliver something to you with you know energy and charisma and all of that stuff. Um, um, but it's more of a performance as opposed to a kind of a dialogue and and two people kind of you know feeding off each other um so I, I think that some some people probably adapted better than others in that sense so those of us who are kind of hands-on coaching and, and 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 really get into the nitty-gritty of of that one-on-one -on -one dynamic with somebody 
I think everyone that I, in, in, in my circle who does that found that quite tough. Whereas people in my circle who, who are more of the kind of you know, presenter style, um, yeah. you know, to group X performer, if you like, um, some of them thrived it on it and, and have loved it and actually don't want to go back. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, all right. Yeah. Yeah, that, it, it is interesting. I know because I always pick up on, um, you know, clients will pick up on things and um, they have found that from how I have been, uh, it's interesting that you say that because how I was sort of online compared to now that they're seeing me in person, they said, oh, it, it, is, it is completely different. And exactly like you say that, you know, um, it is that relationship, that in, that in-person relationship that, that you build. Um, so for, for everyone listening who, you know, might not know your background or um, how you got into coaching and, um, you know, the, uh, the development of your coaching career, if you like, do you just want to give a little bit of a background to yourself? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I've been doing this quite a long time now. Um, so a little bit over 20 years now. Um, so originally, so I was, I was born in the, in the Northwest, but I grew up in the Northeast, um, moved down to London as a 17 year old. So way, way back when. Um, and working in sport and fitness was actually all I ever really wanted to do. Um, and it's, it's, it's a, a funny thing. I was actually back up North a couple of weeks ago, just clearing out a load of, clearing out a load of stuff. Um, and I was probably around, I think probably 12 years old. Um, and there was a, there was an old weight set, like one of the old, like York ones. Oh yeah. yeah. And, um, <laughs> and there was, um, yeah, like it was in it was in the attic basically, um, but I'd written as a twelve year old I'd written exercises and programs and drawn little stick men trying to describe how to do stuff. I was just making it up, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, but it was actually it wasn't bad. <laughs> you know, so I was, I was kind of thinking, okay, um, I was just trying to you know as a twelve year old trying to figure out what did what, what made people better at stuff, why were some people better at things than others, um, and I was kind of obsessed with it really from as as young as that, uh, and ironically. I'd, um, I'd drawn a little like Nike swoosh underneath them all. And I had this like this little sheaf of papers. Uh, and then, you know, many years later, I'm still making exercise programs with a Nike <laughs> swoosh on. So not, not a lot's changed, but then a lot's changed. Um, so I've been doing it really my whole life, but I, I moved down to London to kind of find, you know, the big, big lights of the big city as a, as a 17 year old. Started out as a lot of people do, gym floor. Um, so gym floor, commercial gym, not a very nice commercial gym, doing the picking up towels, putting weights away, uh, at the same time as um, trying to also uh, get involved in professional sport in any which way. So initially as an athlete, so I'd grown up playing rugby league, um, so started you know, trying to get seen and, and, and managed to do so. Um, so managed to get involved with London Broncos as they once were. Uh, which, was, which was great. So I spent some time there and I spent some time at Harlequin. So in those days, it was the same training ground yeah. and some of the same coaches. So that was a, that was a transition. Um, and all the time when I was doing that, I was never that good. I was good, good enough to, to, you know, to be involved at a professional level, but it was never going to be, you know, never going to be a superstar. So I always worked doing this basically in the background. So I always had various personal training, fitness instructor jobs in the background as I was doing that. And also um, put myself through like an undergrad sports science degree with a biomechanics specialism. Um, once I realized I wasn't gonna be a superstar athlete, it was then a case of, of well, what, what else can I do? Um, and started out uh, really thinking I could work for lots of athletes, but you know, I was a 24 year old and thought I knew everything, <laughs> realized very quickly that I didn't. Um, and that you, it's, it's quite a hard thing to do, but it's, uh, it's to be like a strength and conditioning consultant. Um, so I, I worked with a lot of good people in those days, didn't really make any money because uh, I was spending my time here, there and everywhere on the, you know, on the tube and in a car. Um, and then went sort of full circle back into commercial, commercial gyms and spent a good chunk of time back, back there really in, in a few different businesses. Um, for probably 10 years back in commercial gyms um, and now in some sort of unusual symmetry um, I'm back kind of doing my own thing um, yeah. so now I'd still do work for a few different sports organizations and teams and individuals um, but have over the years almost by accident really built a niche doing 
strength and conditioning work in the entertainment industry, which was not something I ever really set out to do. Um, sort of fell into it really, did, you know, did one project, it went well and um, it gathered momentum really. And that's probably 90% of what I do now is um, train people for roles on stage or on screen, um, but train them as you would train an athlete effectively. So rather than just to look a certain way, like, so training people so they can actually do stuff as, as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a common thing. I'm quite, I'm, quite like, I'm quite glad you said that. And I'm sure we'll dive into a couple more topics as we dive in. But um, yeah, that, that phrase there, be able to do it. Um, so it's all well and good maybe looking like an athlete, but um, sometimes uh, you need to have a look and be like, right, can you actually actually use what you what, what you yeah yeah exactly and that was all because i came that route you know i came very much that sport athletic training route um so then when i started to you know it was, it was really necessary the first project i did in the entertainment industry was training somebody for a stage role um and he had to be able to fight on stage and he had to also be able to do a backflip um yeah. so they, had, they had like gymnastics coaches taking care of that i was taking care of the snc side but it was always with that mindset of yeah, at some points he's going to have his shirt off and he wants to, you know, he wants to look good on stage and yeah. great. I, I understand that completely. But also there was a challenge of he's got to be able to do all this stuff and it's a stage role. It's not a screen role where you could have a double. He's got to do it. <laughs> so, yeah. um, so that was that was the first one that I did. Um, and you know, so I went about all of them the same way, really, of, of thinking, well, what's the, what do they have to do? Let's start there. And then what do they have to look like? And that always came, that always became like the secondary task. Yeah. I think that's what, from my point of view, that's why I always like, um, or I really enjoy, enjoy what I do. Because it's problem solving. You've got to think, right, what do they have to do? And how do they get, how do they get there? Um, and throughout sort of, you know, um, uh, all of your uh, coaching career, who have been sort of your biggest influences on your coaching or, philosophies on training a little bit. So I quite like to uh, ask that question just to see, um, you know, what, what people's thoughts are and who other coaches who I follow, who is it that you follow? Yeah, probably some of the same ones actually because you've, um, so you've had some friends of mine who have also, who also are kind of inspire me, if you like, um, on, on this podcast. So there's probably some of the same ones. Um, you know, five, I think we got, when you had um, Tony on here quite recently, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah, Tony's a good friend of mine. I've known Tony for a number of years now. Um, but before I knew Tony as a sort of friend and colleague, we've got a few, a few kind of things that we do as a, a joint enterprise. Um, he was somebody that I followed in terms of, you know, I liked his work. I liked the way he put, he put you know, technical information across in a very user-friendly way. Um, Eric Cressy is another one who, you know, on the strength and conditioning side, I think there's probably no one better, um, it, pro probably anywhere. I think, he, you know, over, certainly over the last five to 10 years, he's gone from being sort of one of a handful to being the man when it comes to- I did his um, shoulder, shoulder course um, and it absolutely blew my mind. Because now, every time I'm in the gym, I kind of look at people and I'm like, exactly see what he's saying in there in yeah. the course that he did it, it was unbelievable really yeah yeah he's he's fantastic uh michael mullins who i don't know if you've come across um so michael is a he's a physical therapist as they call him in the u.s um but kind of has a foot in the snc camp um and he works with a lot of the same populations that i do he works with a lot of performers um so he's someone who i kind of you know, I respect a lot of what, what he does. He's very, very technical. Um, he's a big PRI guy, um, which is a lot of my kind of education and training is, is from, is with looking through that lens. Um, so, you know, I, I resonate a lot with what, what he does. Um, Brett, Barth, Brett Bartholomew, who, yeah. yeah, if you know Brett, um, I think in terms of coach development is probably the man at the moment. Um, and in terms of somebody who sits in the sort of same field as I do, Ben Bruno, if you know Ben, yeah, you know, yeah. Um, who does basically the exactly the same thing I do, but on a much, much bigger scale, <laughs> um, you know, training, you know, training people who, who are going to be performing on stage and all on screen, but training them like athletes. Yeah. 
I, I quite like to ask that question, and there's a, there's a couple of people there that um, you know I'm lucky enough to have uh, uh, Tony Jackpot on the on the podcast as well, and a couple of other people that you've mentioned. I always find that interesting because for the coaches listening, I always want to see whether um, the people that we look up to, who they follow, and it seems that people are following similar sort of um, coaches that are putting some really good content out there, and I think the more that um, you know, I think we said it in the, in the email when, when we talked emails um, that to be able to put more quality information out there and kind of filter out some of the things that um, are maybe a little bit a little bit misleading. Um, and that kind of goes on to the to the first um, couple of topics that I wanted to wanted to chat about. Um, so obviously you mentioned there the, the background, um, you know, doing a, a degree and you know focusing on biomechanics and not just. Um, having your clients just look good but be able to perform as well. What kind of um, uh, things are you taking into account? Is it not just, um, right, I need to strip a lot of fat from and make them look good? Um, what other sort of elements of um, your coaching are you looking at? Because the uh, general population from the outside looking in will just see that end product. Um, so could, you just want to give a little bit of a background on um, the elements that you're looking at when you first start working with um, the, the performance side of things. Sure. Um, so as I was saying, really, the, the aesthetic, even though it's part of the brief, is for me the secondary goal. Um, so I'm looking at the performance goal first. And sometimes, I mean, our, our job is a little, is always, I think, a little of balancing what somebody wants with what they need. Um, and I think we're, everyone who's been in our job for a while can probably resonate with that a little bit. Yeah. Um, and what somebody wants and what they need might not always be the same thing. Uh, but our job, I believe, is to, do, is to try and combine that and blend it. The balance of those two will vary slightly. And it might begin to, in, the, in that initial period, it might be a little bit more of what somebody wants and just kind of sneaking in a bit of what they need. And then as you get that buy-in and traction, you might try and shift that balance slightly and give them a little bit more of what they need and they might find that actually they quite enjoy that and they quite enjoy feeling better and, and feeling like they're moving better and things that were uncomfortable or, or perhaps painful before stop being and then that sort of becomes what they want as well um so that's always a little bit of a, a kind of tug of war and 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 trade-off yeah um, i go about it that way um, i take the initial brief of you know there was one that i did for a very big film of somebody that had to have quite dramatic weight loss and a very high profile actor. Um, and the brief was he had to lose, you know, 20 kilos. Like he was, he's a big guy. Um, so in quite a lot of weight. So you couldn't take your eye too far off. Well, that's, that's got to happen. But also in my initial consultation and, and, and sort of assessment of him, there was, there was quite a substantial, when he's a 58 year old man, um, there was quite a lot of, he was quite a lot of history. <laughs> you know, he'd, he'd over, over the years done various things and certain things bothering him, certain little niggles that he had. Um, so it would be, you know, as, a, you know, as, as a professional, our, our initial you know, uh, sort of calling should always be do no harm. You know, it's, it's the, in the medical profession, I believe that should spill over into our profession. I wish it did more loudly than it does. <laughs> um, but if, you, if you're keeping that in mind, you, you have to address that. Once you know about it and you know what to do about it, if you then don't address it, in my opinion, that you're then being negligent. Um, so first and foremost, if I take somebody on, their well-being then becomes my responsibility. So if I know there are certain things I can do to help him or certain things that he needs to stop to, stop doing in order to help himself, then we're going to do that. At the same time as managing this overriding project of, right, well, you've got to drop 20 kilos by this date and it has to be that date because that's when that scene's being filmed um so we've got to do that but also we've got to start doing this too um so i just have i have that frank conversation with people and it comes up as part of the evaluation i mean assessment and client assessment onboarding is something i'm very big on um i, I think it's it's probably the most important thing that you'll do with somebody is that information gathering um and if you if you if you're not doing that then you're not really you're not really delivering what you what you should be you've got no idea really what you're delivering you're just kind of hoping for the best and throwing stuff yeah absolutely um, you're just sort of walking around in the dark really if you don't yeah. have that that first, that first assessment um, so just, and as 
yeah, just you, you could just be making it up, make, making it up as you go along. Um, and I know, you know, from from the clients I work with, give me as much information as, as we can because I don't want to be a couple of weeks down the line and all of a sudden you turn around and say, oh yeah, I had a bad, I had a real major operation on my lower back a couple of years ago, and it's like, well, why did you not put that in the in the in the in the initial yeah. assessment? And that's a skill. Sometimes people sometimes people forget. Sometimes people are embarrassed to say, or they're uncomfortable to say, or um, something that you know, I work a lot with with young trainers in a sort of education mentoring capacity as well, and they're nervous. You know, trainers are nervous, and and so they don't. You know, not that comfortable asking the questions. However, what I always say to these guys is, however nervous you are, the client is that times a hundred. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> this is your, this is that's your house. You work in that gym. You're comfortable there, or you should be. It might be the first time they've ever set foot in one. Um, so, however nervous you are. You know, trust me they are a lot more they are a lot more so um so it's understandable that sometimes things get missed so that thoroughness of the assessment evaluation is key um and that you know that that to me is quite a quite a lengthy process and it's i really like to get under the skin of how people are moving as well as how they're feeling and other things that are going on in their life as well so you know i get really <laughs> I, I get really in there so it all comes up so when i you know when i take one of these projects on that first meeting is really, really important. Um, and we're going to get all of that information out. And as we get it out, that's a skill I think that you develop over time is one, how to get it out, but then two, how to get it out and then frame it in such a way that you're along with the client, building that program with them or building that plan of action with them. So, okay, so this happens when you do that. So there are potentially some things that we can do to help that. How does that sound? you're kind of building that buy-in as you go. Um, and by the end of that evaluation session, the client's got a pretty good idea what that framework and plan is going to look like. They don't know like sets and reps and what exercise you're doing, but they have an idea of, okay, so this is what's expected. Um, this is what's going to be expected from me come Monday morning when we get started. Um, and then you're going at it as a, you know, as a, as a combined effort rather than them coming in saying, right, well, I've got to lose some weight. I've got to get sweaty and I want some abs. And me saying, right, well, this back issue that you had 15 years ago, we're going to get started on that. And then there's a, there's a conflict. Yeah. That, that conflict shouldn't happen if you've gone about that evaluation onboarding in the right way and you've asked the right questions. And as you've kind of excavated that information, so framed it back to the client and understanding that, well, we need to get you to move a lot if we're going to drop that weight. If you're going to move a lot, this is going to be uncomfortable and then you might have to stop and we're going to be much more successful if you don't have to stop. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, I would, in, I would frame it in that way. It is a, um, what I think sometimes it's not a, a kind of a dictatorship of when people come in and the, the coach or the trainer is just saying, yep, yeah, you're going to do this. You want to be uh, sweating buckets and you're going to be napping when you, when you walk out of the gym. Um, it has to be sort of a team effort, a team yeah. effort if you like. Um, because at the end of the day, they're coming in, um, and the clients coming in. Uh, it has to be. I think we said it. That it's got to be within their, um, their best interests rather than just um, focusing on, on on one point. You know, there's always going to be different areas to look at. Um, one thing that I just wanted to touch on from there, because obviously, um, what might differ between um, performers, if you like, with a set date and general population. Um, what are your thoughts on like the time scale um, of you know um, getting that in that in the, because if you've got if you know a film or a show is going to be at a certain time um, that might put some extra stresses on um, on the on the client and other things might take into account they might start start worrying about whereas the general maybe general population um, might be a holiday or, or, or something like that you know is a time where they're going to relax as opposed to um, being in a film or, or performing on stage. What are your thoughts on time scale? And is there some sort of pros and scot pros and cons depending on that time scale? Um, yeah, so I think, I think with any goal setting, making it time bound is important. Otherwise, you can just keep, you know, kicking the can down the road. Um, and that preparation phase can, can just go on forever. Um, you know, when there's a when there's a time frame on something, it makes it very real, uh, makes it very tangible, it's very measurable, um, and I think that's very important. Whether it's general population, 
or you know it, well, people are people at the end of the day so if it's you know if it's you know dave from accounts versus you know hollywood movie star they're still made of the same stuff like they're, they're, you know their bodies still do the same things um it's just the difference being that for one of them it's their job um so for one of them it is his job or her job to get in a particular physical condition by a particular time whereas dave from accounts it's not um, so he could potentially keep kicking the can down the road, but we'll have much more chance of him being successful if we do put some time frames around it. Um, but we also have to be mindful that it's not, even though these people are made of the same stuff and their, you know, their bodies do the same things and will have the same responses to different things, somebody for whom their body is their livelihood, whether it's you know, an actor, a performer or an athlete, they, to me, that's all in the same bracket. If their body is their livelihood, it's not. It's not a fair. It's not a fair fight. You can't necessarily compare. Uh, you, you know, you, you're starting with the same raw materials, but it is. It genuinely is not a level playing field. Dave from accounts has got to go and do accounts as well, most of the time, and and that's what's that's what's putting food on the table and keeping a roof over his head. So he's got a lot of other stuff to deal with and to and to think about. So in a lot of ways, even though people who do these kind of transformation type things for want of a better word, I hate that word, but for want of a better word in, in the entertainment industry. So do some projects like some of the ones that I do sometimes get held up as being like, well, that's the ultimate, like that's, it's actually easier, but right? it's, it's much harder to do that and get that kind of effect with Dave from accounts. Cause you've got all these other factors to consider. You know, you've got you've got his home life, you've got his work life, you've got other stuff happening that you've got to try and, affect change with all of these other things happening in their world somebody where it's their job to do that it's the only thing they've got to think about yeah and a lot of the time in this project i'm working on the at the moment a uh, show that was due to start in april of this year it's been postponed obviously um is now going to start in april of next year um and all all this person has got to worry about is their physical condition yeah. that's it <laughs> everything is everything else is taken care of you know there's there is no other stresses in this person's life other than that um so from the coach's point of view it's almost like being back at university where you've got like the classic exact you've got the perfect example of saying well this is the diet this is the training program and that's the result i expect and you'll pretty much get it because there's no other variable so it's kind of easy the hard bit is getting the getting the work <laughs> but yeah. the execution of those projects is actually quite easy compared to the general fitness. Um, so when we sort of look at our industry and saying, oh, these guys are the ones who are doing the hard jobs, they're getting this person in incredible shape for that role or, you know, for that stage show. Keep in mind that if you're working with general population people in a commercial gym just down the road, what you're doing is harder. And if you're getting the results, you're, you're achieving more <laughs> than that. The, so the hard part of that is getting the getting the projects in the first place. The delivery of it is relatively straightforward as long as you've got the buy-in from the client. I'm quite glad because when you said there, you know, obviously it is their uh, job to, um, to to focus on their body exactly like you said. But further, um, you know, using data from accounts as, as an example and um, the, the general population side. Do you think that sometimes where they can get a little bit misled sometimes and actually they think oh well um i can just follow i can follow the program that so and so so and so did um and then that's it i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna um get that get getting that uh shape or, or get those results and um, without taking into account that you know they need to put their stress the sleep and and, and all the other variables and, and every, everything else <laughs> yeah 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 as well as their job and their family and you know their dog <laughs> yeah abs absolutely um because sometimes you know from the, from the outside looking in um they must think oh well i only have to eat this certain uh, type of food or i only have to do that do that training um so with the uh, with the general population side of things um would the because you can see you know like what you mentioned there about you know the the 12 week transformations and um get abs in four weeks or or, or or whatever it may be um do you think that um time scales need to be a little bit longer and it needs to be sort of a full package side of things like what you mentioned there about all the all the other variables for, for the general population 
Um, I think I think that really our industry needs to accept a lot of responsibility, things like that. And by, by our industry, I mean coaches and trainers. Some coaches and trainers do pedal stuff like that, and I think they need to have a long, hard look at themselves. Um, but also, there's a lot of associated media around our industry as well, um, and that needs to take some responsibility also. And it's something I have... You know, I, I take a, and spend a lot of time and effort addressing that. You know, I, I'm fortunate enough to have a reasonable voice within the media, and I try to use it for exactly that, um, and to making sure that information that's being put out there is one correct and two relevant. Um, and where it, 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 I, I have done and, and still continue to do a lot of work for um, for Esquire magazine, um, and. Uh, just a you know a conversation I had with uh, one of the you know, someone very senior at Esquire was saying that still now, and this must be, God, this film must be at least fifteen years old now. But still now, the most googled, the most searched article on Esquire.com was is Brad Pitt's Fight Club workout. Right. Um, <laughs> and and you know that must be what fifteen years old that film yeah. at least. Um, and yeah, I mean, he looks in fantastic shape for that film, um, but that's not relevant for most people. Um, and having having worked on projects like that and know it, it, what goes into it, and all of the the fact that there are no other variables. So the you know the last big film kind of prep thing that I did, we hired a chef. The guy was living in a hotel for six months. We hired a chef as long as he only ate what that chef prepared, and he and he did the workouts that I gave him and I knew he was doing that because he did every single one with me. There's like, well, there's not really very much that can go wrong. <laughs> um, so, it, but that's not livable for most people. Most people aren't going to lock themselves away in a hotel and only eat what their personal chef has put in a box in their suite each day. That's just not going to happen. Um, so I've no idea who did the preparation for Brad Pitt in, in Fight Club, but whoever, I would imagine it's probably something a little bit like, like that. Um, <laughs> But I strongly believe and feel that um, something like that is is what we kind of colloquially just call clickbait. It's like you print that article or you put that post up because you know people are going to search for it and you know people are going to look at it. And I think that the media attached to our industry does have to take some responsibility for not just perpetuating things that are either untrue or unattainable. Um, and saying, well, you know, get this body in six weeks is just silly. If you're nearly there, it might be possible. If you're nowhere near, it's not going to be possible. Um, and that for me is where it falls down. And that's for me where they kind of, you know, add an inch to your arms in six weeks on the cover of a magazine is just, it's just stupid. Um, you know, if you've never trained before and, you know, you eat like a sparrow and then all of a sudden you start training and you start eating a lot, that might be possible. And, and, and it might well be achievable. And so someone might have done it, in which case that's probably where they got their headline from. But for most people, that's probably not going to happen. And, and that's where we've got to start collectively taking some responsibility, I think. And I, and I include within that um, you know, journalists who feed into our industry, feed into it and feed off it as well. Um, uh, absolutely. It's funny that you mentioned about... Uh, 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 Brad Pitt in Fight Club. I actually had a client who came in, you know, talking about goals and where they want to be, and he did actually say, he was like, yeah, in an ideal world, I'd, 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 I'd want to look like that. Um, there was other you know, factors, did a movement assessment and other things and um, uh, things that we'd have to take into account. But I think one of the biggest things is just managing expectations um, of, look, we could probably get to that point, but this is what it's going to take to get there. Um, and exactly like what we've what we've mentioned, it might be um, there might be other things like a really stressful job, right? Stress can have an effect on 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 things. Um, so you know we're not going to get as get as close as, as where we want to be because um, uh, I think you mentioned it that you think that this is ideal and you only have to follow that one program. Um, but there are other things, uh, other. Um, factors that, that you need to take into account. And obviously, we mentioned about sort of the social, the social media side of, side. Of it. Um, do you think? Because obviously now looking at 
Um, over to before, it would be just looking on the front of a, of a magazine or anything like that. But now, um, social media is not just sort of how people are looking, um, but also also the supplement side of things. And from the uh, uh, from the you know Davin accounts looking in, um, how do you put across how to filter um, the information that that, they're, um, that people are getting? Because obviously. Um, if you see something that says take this supplement and you're going to lose 10 kilos of fat in two weeks, um, you can get sucked in there like clickbait. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, social, I have a love hate relationship with social media, really. Um, the, I mean, the positive side of it is it gives everyone a voice, and then the negative side of it is it gives everyone a voice. <laughs> um, and that's, especially in our industry, which is unregulated at the best of times, you know, the, you know, the barrier to it's something that, again, something that I'm personally trying to do everything I can to try and address this. Um, barrier to entry into our industry in the UK is low to non-existent. Um, and that's to get a certification. You, know, you get a certification in a weekend, you know, a guaranteed pass rate, pay the money, here's a certificate. You, then you look at the social media side of things, the, like the Instagram trainer, and you don't even need that. You need an iPhone. And then you can call yourself whatever you want. Um, you know, I, I've often said to people, calling yourself an Instagram trainer is a little bit like saying I'm a soldier on Call of Duty. It's like, <laughs> but, you know, yeah, but you're not. <laughs> you know, it's, um, anyone who is a successful online trainer, and I know a few, and obviously the way the world is at the moment, that's becoming a... a, a a feather in a lot of people's hats and they're, and, they're, and they're having to embrace it. But in order to be a successful, incredible online trainer, you have to know how to do it in real life and you have to have done it and actually, you know, done it for, for an amount of time where it is your job, you know, where you have to be successful at it. Otherwise you haven't got any money coming in. Um, so somebody who's doing anything really is a bit of a side gig. I'm, I'm, off, I'm asked this question quite a lot saying, well, I do this and I want to be a successful trainer on the side. Well, you, you're not going to be. Yeah. You, you, know, you know, No one really becomes a successful anything unless they're all in. Um, and, and actually, you know, when something becomes your, your job, it then becomes much more than a hobby and there's, there's pressure on you to succeed. So therefore, if there's pressure on you to succeed, there's pressure on you to deliver results, um, which means you can't be just peddling rubbish. Yeah. Um, so I think if people are kind of browsing and think, well, where do I get my information from? Um, you look at, you know, look at the sources, look at who's putting it out and understand is, is that this, is this something that somebody does for a job? Um, or is this something that somebody's doing as a side gig and really their job is being on a dating show, yeah. <laughs> um, any dating show <laughs> um, <laughs> or, um, you know, are, are they, are they qualified and experienced in, in doing what they in, in doing what they say they are? Um, the second thing I'd also say is is look to see who they're working with. Um, you know, if you're if you're wanting to either engage someone as a trainer, as in like you know hire them and pay them for their services, or simply just follow the information that the people are putting out there, um, you, you should be looking. Firstly, are they qualified and experienced in in delivering it? Um, but secondly, who are they delivering that to? You know, if you're wanting someone to, if you want to follow a, you know, you want to train because you want to do the marathon next year uh, or you want to do a 10K, look for somebody who's worked with people on marathon prep, you know, and probably not who is someone who's worked with pro athletes on marathon prep, but someone who's worked with someone like you to do their first one. Look for that. You know, look for the track record. The same thing as if you're looking first, you know, you want to follow a weight loss plan for, I don't know, for whatever, for some holiday or for a wedding or for any, or whatever reason, or for, you know, for health reasons, then don't follow the marathon guy. Like follow someone who's, who's taken clients on a weight loss journey, but not someone who's taken, you know, supermodels and Hollywood actors on a weight loss journey. Take someone who's worked with people like you on a weight loss journey, whoever you are. If you are a Hollywood A-lister, then find someone who's done that. <laughs> or, or if you are, you know, if you are Dave from accounts, then find someone who's worked with Dave from HR, you know, who's probably got similar, similar kind of lifestyle, similar kind of issues, um, similar kind of balancing act to try and have as, as, you, as you have. Um, and that's the person to try and to, to follow and to get information from someone who's got experience of delivering the goal that you want to achieve to somebody like you. Um, you know, if you want to run faster, 
you shouldn't go and find Usain Bolt's sprint program because <laughs> it's probably not going to be appropriate. Yeah, you know, absolutely. There might, be some bits of it, there might be some bits of it that are useful, but for the most part, you, you probably shouldn't be doing it. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, why I asked that question is obviously with, um, yes, there was online coaching obviously before COVID, um, but now, um, and I, I do online you know, coaching, coaching myself, however, um, now that it's, it's, it's progressed a little bit, um, it seems to be that everybody's on there, especially on Instagram, you know, it can be right, this, this, this is what we're doing. And it's interesting that you mentioned there um, about, yeah, if you want to get faster, follow Usain Bolt's training program. Um, I actually hosted a seminar with Eddie Hall, um, right. and it wasn't long after he did the 500 kilo deadlift. Um, yeah. And in his seminar, obviously, one of the main questions was, what did you program? What did, what did you do you know, when, when we did like a QA? and a um, and he said, I'll show you the program. This is, this is, this is how, this is how I did it. Um, and the next week, everybody came in and was wanting to do that program. But for him, the level of athlete that he is, that was based, that, that was based on him. And, um, you know, we've, we've touched it on, you, you mentioned there, um, find somebody, uh, whoever you are. And I think it is, um, everybody is an, an, an individual and it comes back to that point of, um, you know, doing the assessment and focusing on, on everything that um, is right for that person rather than, right, well, I want to get stronger and I'll follow Eddie Hall's program. Whereas actually it needs to be something specific, specific to you. Um, a, a prime example is um, uh, I've got a, she was going to compete in a, a powerlifting competition at the start of the year. Obviously a lot of powerlifting competitions have got cancelled um, and she had a, a weight loss journey, if you like, and then wanting to start getting stronger. So you start from the bottom and build up rather than looking at the, yeah, we want to compete in powerlifting and progress, but we're not going to start at any old program and work backwards. We might get to that point, you know, but you know, it's, it's starting at the bottom and working back up. Um, that goes on to sort of uh, one of the other questions that I wanted to chat on, and we, we mentioned a little bit about it, is um, the definition of sort of health and what that should look like be the actors and performers, um, and obviously they're in, in great shape, but um, like what you mentioned, sometimes you might have to have a dramatic weight loss in a, in a couple of weeks. Um, what's your thoughts on that? And what should people be um, looking for in terms of health and what may potentially be unhealthy? Um, well, in, in terms of, do you mean in terms of body composition or do you mean not the overall, uh, all of it? Uh, yeah, let's go all of it. Let's let's dive in on that. <laughs> um, so when it's if, you, if you're talking all of it, then it's my philosophy and the, what I go about with all of my clients um, and in any writing I do, I always can can relate back to the same thing. Um, is like pillars, are measurable pillars of wellness. Um, and the the first one that I have is muscular strength because I feel that that underpins underpins everything. Um, the second one is work capacity, so cardio fitness effectively. Third one, mobility, motor control. Um, fourth, body composition. And by that, I mean healthy body composition. So if somebody needs to put weight on or off, we're, it's measurable. But also we're thinking, well, what, what, what is healthy? Especially in these times where, you know, BMI is not something that we as professionals tend to love that expression. However, when you're talking population trends it is a it is a useful statistic so at the moment it is a statistic that people are aware of and thinking am i at risk because i'm too high or too low um, and the fifth is emotional well-being um, so all five of those pillars are measurable you can, you can quantify all of them you can measure them you can track progress in all of those through different means um, but they're all important so i believe that somebody's fitness journey or their their health and fitness journey this you know the health is about more than fitness obviously has got to have touch points into all five of those the emphasis on each of those five will vary depending upon the individual and their goals you know if it's movie star has to look this uh, you know look this way by this point we might put a lot more emphasis on body composition than on the others but we're still working on all the others you know we're still going to address his mobility issues and his motor control He's, we still, we're still going to have a strength component. We're still going to have to work on him getting stronger. And we're still going to assess the fact that it, it, does he just hate this? You know, are we, you know, it, because we have a responsibility on to, to do that as well. So we have to address emotional well-being as well. 
if they hate it and they hate us, what's the chances of them adhering to the plan? Yeah, absolutely. Very, 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 very slim. Um, if it's a general population client, those kind of five, if you imagine it as a bar chart, those five bars might all be quite even. You might think, well, actually, you know, your primary motivation for being here might be, well, I'm a bit stressed. I just want to feel a bit better. So, okay. So emotional well-being is where we're going to start. What do you enjoy doing? Um, what do you, what's going to get you here? What do you like? Um, and then we'll work from there. But we'll make sure that what we do has got a mobility component, has got a strength component. We are addressing work capacity, aerobic fitness. And so they all come into it and everybody gets something, whether they know about it or not. Yeah. <laughs> so, so everybody gets something in one of those categories and I'm consciously addressing each of those and we're also tracking and measuring each of those. Yeah. Um, and I think if we're not doing, if we're missing something out, we're not really doing our job. Um, and that for me is where the kind of the, the health part of health and fitness that sometimes gets forgotten about needs to come back in. And actually, to, to be honest, to go full circle, when you, so right at the start, how are things kind of post, post COVID, I mean, post lockdown really, rather than post COVID. But I, I actually believe that that is going to be something that is going to become more important again in our industry. I think that the, the health component is going to come back to the front of people's minds. Um, as we understand that by the looks of things, this isn't going anywhere anytime soon. Um, so without, you know, without a cure, without a vaccine, the only defense we've got, the only defense anyone's got is their health. Um, so would you rather be super ripped so that you can be on the front of men's health? Or would you rather be confident that should you get COVID, your chances of survival are pretty good? Yeah. So, you know, 100%. Um, <laughs> it, it, tied in, it tied in. I always try to um, make questions so that uh, it, do, it does come around full circle. And I, I couldn't have probably worded that. Any any better myself really because I wanted that as the as the uh, as the last sort of question like um, because you know at the start it's about you know uh, we mentioned that it's it's their job and there's other things that you've got to take into account and uh, especially now um, health is important and I think I always like the analogy uh, I think it was Mike Boyle that said it and have a look at what buckets are full and which ones need me topping up a little bit more yeah. You think about um, obviously you know seeing the work that you do and those those five pillars and um, yeah you can swap and change each time as long as you're keeping an eye on all of them and push one a little bit more drop back a little bit depending on um, uh, especially for the, to the general population depending on um, what their time scale is and, and, and what, what what their goals are and um, so yeah I thought that was a that was a nice full, full circle coming back there um, but the, the last question uh, if, if you like, from everything that we've, we've chatted about there, um, what would be your take-home points or words of wisdom uh, for everyone listening? Um, for, well, assuming I'm te talking to a, an audience of trainers, which, which is a, probably a fairly safe assumption, um, it's, you know, my strong message to the, to the training world is being consistent and, and being credible in, in what you do. Um, so don't try and blag it basically because people can find out um, <laughs> so if you're consistently saying the same thing over time and people's messaging can change and it can evolve like my, you know mine mine has for sure um over the 20 years i've been doing this i've gone from being like well i only work with athletes to now well actually i only really work with performers with a few athletes um so you know mine's with big you know 10 years of general population fitness in the middle so that's that's evolved but my philosophy and my values haven't really changed in that it's health first. Um, and I think it doesn't really, for me, it doesn't really matter what your thing is, but if you're consistent about what your thing is, whatever it is, whether it's, you know, whether it's yoga or if it's powerlifting or if it's boxing or if it's fat loss, whatever your thing is, like be really good at that. And, you know, and if you, if you, if you try and always sort of follow a trend and say, right, well, you know, this is cool this week or like CrossFit's trending I'm going to do that now it's hit classes or now I'm, now I'm doing yoga on the beach it all just gets a little bit lost and, and for me when you're sort of looking and you know I've done a lot of kind of talent identification of trainers for various people over the years as well and for me that's something I'm always looking at saying well what, who are you like, what do you do like do you are you an SNC guy are you a, a hit trainer are you a yoga teacher like what's your thing um, and 
it should be quite obvious that with a little bit of digging, you find out, oh, that's what you're about. And that's fine. And you might be able to do some other stuff as well. And most of us can. Um, but that's really what your passion is. Um, and as, as I say, passions can evolve and change. But you should really, like, if you're consistent with your beliefs, it should be kind of obvious like what, what your thing is. Um, so that's, that would be my my sort of take home point or, or bit of advice, if you like, to the, to yeah, the industry. Absolutely. Is, I think be consistent with who you are. Um, no matter whether it's cool at the moment or not. Yeah. If, if it's not cool at the moment, that's fine. It'll be cool at some point. And when it is, everything, you know, this, this, like fads come and go, fashions and trends come and go. Our industry is very faddy and different things step to the front at different periods of time. Um, and if you're always like the best powerlifting guy, and then when powerlifting, powerlifting is cool, you're already the best one. Yeah. Right? But if CrossFit is cool at the moment, you're a powerlifting guy and you're thinking, well, I can, I can kind of do that. By the time you've got good at that, <laughs> you've done something else. You're always really behind. So my big thing is like, just be consistently you, whatever it is. Like, be the best you possibly can be at your thing. And, and eventually it will all, you'll get your time. 100%, I think, because um, we have interns that, that come, in, come into the gym and, um, I know I I know I did it when I when I first started coaching and kind of want to do everything, be, be good at everything, and yeah, I can do boxing, I can teach you how to weightlift, I can teach you how, how to do powerlifting, um, but now it's got to a point where no, I'm, I'm I know what I'm I know what I'm what I am passionate about. You know the strength training, the powerlifting side of things. Yeah, it can help with fat loss and, and that sort of stuff. But um, yeah, yeah, exactly like you say, if, you, if you're consistent with it rather than, uh, yeah, that phrase, uh, jack of all trades, master of none. Um, I think it's sometimes you can see that within the, it's a lot easier to do. Whereas, um, yeah, you know, because I've, for example, a, a rugby guy came in, um, I want to get stronger for rugby. Actually, it was already pretty strong. Um, I think it would be better actually you working with, uh, there's another uh, coach that I work with um, who does athletic performance and work with sprinters and it's going to be right. much better for his game to get faster and use his strength rather than me getting really, really strong, essentially a powerlifting competition as opposed to using that strength in rugby. So uh, yeah. yeah, I think that was a, a really good point to, to finish on. Um, for... Thanks a lot for taking the time to, to chat with me, Luke. Really, really appreciate your time to jump on and um, you know do a little bit of myth busting and put a little bit more information out there. Um, for everyone listening who might want to um, see your uh, where you put your content or have any questions on um, the topics that we talked about today, where can people find you or, or see your content? Uh, well, my website is like the conduit to all of it, really. Um, so it's just LukeWorthington.com. Um, and that's got like articles and my, my social media all connects there as well, um, as well as any other bits and pieces that I'm doing. So any products that I'm involved with um, are all there as well. So whether that's training programs, whether that's coaching development or it's seminars or whatever, you can see it all on there. My social media is just Luke W Training and that's uh, Twitter and Instagram. But the website is kind of, that's home base. Awesome. Um, 100% everyone listening, um, check out the work that, that Luke does. It really is um, uh, you know, informative and um, points you in, uh, in, in, in the direction rather than um, you know, things that you may be com- confused about. So um, thanks a lot. Thanks again for taking the time to chat with me, Luke. Um, thanks a lot to everyone listening, and I will see you all next week.